welcome to Flavors of Africa. I'm Doris Ufuebune. And I'm Kevin Ufuebune. And today on our show, we're going to take a trip down south and we're going to look at the United States of America, our neighbors, simply because the U.S. certainly has a connection to Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, many people in the United States, African Americans in particular, trace their ancestry all the way to Africa, particularly parts of of uh, the western the western side of africa uh countries such as ghana what's known as nigeria today and things like that so we're going to take a look at that and just in, com in comparison growing up in africa and in nigeria what did you think of the west before immigrating to canada beautiful beautiful you know when i was in nigeria we heard mostly about the united states simply because of uh, Reverend S.W. Martin. Reverend S.W. Martin uh, is from Iseluku in Delta State of Nigeria. And uh, he traveled to America many, many years ago and studied there. And he came back to Nigeria in 1921. So that's how, as a child, I started knowing about America. And he built so many schools and colleges. Mm -hmm. And I will also tell you that my dad happened to be working in his mission, the Pilgrim Baptist Mission, and there were so many missionaries that came to my town uh, during that period. And they used to do cinema, you know, <laughs> movies, and they would shoot different movies. And I happened to be one of those people that participated. I was maybe about age five or six, somewhere there. And those missionaries at the end of the school year would, you know, invite me specifically because of my dad. And they would take different pictures. So at the end of the year, they would show it as a movie. And it was so interesting. And the other thing I will tell you about America growing up is that um, each year, those uh, missionaries will come to Iseluku in the state of Nigeria. And they will visit uh, uh, schools, different schools that was built by Reverend S.W. Martin. And they will also uh, visit churches, especially the Pilgrim Baptist uh, Church. And um, I love going to church growing up. And very early in the morning, you know, on Sunday, I will, you know, uh, get ready to go. So I think I also I was about seven, eight years old when uh, the missionary started bringing gifts to my town. And I remember waiting for my uh, cousins yes. to go to church. But after a while, I said to myself, why did I have to be late knowing that I, I woke up so early to go to church? So I started going. So as I was going, I saw Reverend S.W. Martin and their wife. They were driving their beautiful American <laughs> car. So they stopped and gave me a ride. And I tell you that that was the one of the best moments of my life. Because when I got to church, I didn't know that those missionaries were waiting to wow. give gifts to children. <laughs> and I usually sit in front of the uh, congregation. Exactly. In front, it, it was a Sunday school. And I usually sit in front of the class. Mm -hmm. And that very day, they came with bags. And they said, you know, we're going to start from the back. I said, oh my God, now I'm not going to receive the gift. I was so nervous. I said, what if I know he doesn't get to me, right? Growing up, so I'm telling you the experience, you know, about America. But, you know, they shared the bags and we all received the bags. That's it was wonderful. wonderful. And in the morning, I put all my pencils, everything, and I went to school proudly, you know. And they also came to school. They came to the school and gave us more gifts. I received two bags. So... It was, uh, when I think of America, yes. that, those West. are the things I remember, the West. But it wasn't until I came, to, well, I wouldn't say until I came to Canada because we, we read about the slave trade yes. in Nigeria. You were a teacher. Exactly, thought. I was a teacher, so I knew um, much about uh, the West. But it wasn't until I came here that I truly embraced it. Like, there's always, uh, you know, what we had in Nigeria was a single story, right? Coming here, I was able to understand, like, wow, there are so many things that I didn't know about the West. Okay, so now learning more about uh, this part of the world, which are you more connected to now? I mean, after living in the West for many years now, but still having your roots in Nigeria. Well, 
I have to ask. I always say that I'm more connected to both. I'm connected to both because when I'm here, when I'm in Canada, I truly embrace my Canadian, you know, heritage, if I may use that, because I'm a, I'm a Canadian citizen. But when I go back to Nigeria, it's a different story. It's like remembering how I grew up, every, most people that I left, you know, behind, it's always very um, emotional, emotional, especially coming back. You know, so it, it depends on, you know, how... Situation. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's really interesting. I mean, for many uh, people coming here, it's, mm -hmm. it's sort of a culture shock for a lot of people, but they do tend to sort of embrace uh, the new society and new culture as well. Yes. Well, we're going to talk more about that. We're going to talk more about newcomers coming to the West and embracing sort of our communication patterns yes. and the differences. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to sit down and talk with Janet Arnold, who is a registered social worker. She's affiliated with Mount Royal University. So she's going to tell us all yes. about communication, nonverbal communication as well as verbal, and how to sort of fit in in a, in a new environment that's mm -hmm. sort of different. So we're looking forward to that. Awesome. So there's more coming up on Flavors of Africa. And of course, we have another delicious dish that we're going to bring to you while focusing on the United States and finding their roots in Africa. Stay tuned. And welcome back to Flavors of Africa. Joining us today is Janet Arnold, a registered social worker from Mount Royal University. Welcome, Janet. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yes. So can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a second generation native Calgarian, something I'm very proud of. Um, I work at Mount Royal University in three different roles. So I'm an access advisor working with students with disabilities. I'm a part-time counselor, and I also teach for the Department of Psychology and Continuing Education. Interesting. That's wonderful. Yeah. So uh, can you tell us about communication? I know that that's one of your special fields, mm -hmm. uh, nonverbal communication and verbal communication. If you can just enlighten us on on that, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of people think of communication primarily as verbal. So what is, what is it that we're saying and listening to? Mm -hmm. um, but a part, big part of communication is the stuff that we don't say. So it's our body language. It's the tone of our voice. It's what we wear. It's how we move. It's our, our posture. So all of those things actually impact how we communicate or how we receive communication from someone else. Uh, if I were to go to a new culture, a new country today, uh -huh. uh, how would I sort of learn about that, about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable? What, what kind of communication is acceptable and not acceptable? A, a, good, a good place to start would be if you knew someone from that country or that culture and to say, you know, I'm traveling to this place. Is there anything in terms of communication that I need to know about? Are there certain gestures that I should stay away from or gestures that are good things to do? Um, you might also ask about the, the common distance between people. In some cultures, it's very common to be very close. Mm -hmm. um, co Japanese, Chinese cultures, are very, they have a very small um, personal space. Whereas in Europe and, and North America, we tend to have a further space. So usually a comfortable distance is in, in our culture is about an, an arm's length. So if you come into my arm's length, I might feel a little like you're getting a little bit too personal yes. too quickly, unless I kind of invite you in. Yeah, so we, we want to know those kinds of things. And often we can tell by how someone responds to us. So if somebody were to step quite close to me, I would likely step back if I didn't know them very well. And hopefully they'd get the message that, oh, okay, I, I stepped too close, and then they would leave it at that. But sometimes you see this dance going on, is the person steps closer, and then the person, I might back up, and then they come closer, and I back up, and then we're, mm -hmm. you know, out the door. And that usually isn't such a comfortable yeah. um, communication set, you know. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, when new com uh, newcomers come to Canada, mm -hmm. and coming in with their culture, and sometimes, because of cultural variations, they might be perceived as being rude because, you know, they don't have the Canadian, uh, should I say, experience or, you know, the way of life. So how can we also encourage Canadians mm -hmm. to 
you know, exactly, and appreciate, <laughs> you know, diversity because those people coming here, they are not Canadians. Like, we have our own culture, you know, the intonation is everything here. You know, the way we say things back home when I was growing up, it's totally different. So coming to Canada is going to be a big challenge for most people. So um, I think what can we do to encourage them to, or what can Canadians, as Canadians, how can we, you know, um, be more welcoming? Exactly, <laughs> and understand them and know that they are not rude. Because sometimes yeah. you hear, oh this, oh, this person is so rude. It's not because they are rude. It's just because of the culture that they, you know, they are from. Yeah. Exactly. I think sometimes to help Canadians understand that everybody is different. And we, we grow up in our own environment. Mm -hmm. And whether that's a culture, even families have different ways of behaving in a family. So for... Um, for Canadians to be to know this is a learning process and to be curious and inviting yes. and say you know I see that you t you talk differently than I do or you move differently than I do tell me more about that what's it like at home so if we can be more um, curious and inviting and understanding yes. and wanting to learn from each other that's what's going to make us a better country exactly. we can learn from people who are newcomers newcomers can feel appreciated and welcomed here that that would be my my goal for, exactly. for Canada. Yeah, I, it makes me sad when that doesn't always happen and I yes. certainly know that sometimes people are portrayed as being rude, rude. or pushy yeah. but that's how they survived or that's what that that's what had to happen in their country it's of true. origin yes. or their city or whatever it was so we need more understanding and more compassion. Mm -hmm. More understanding, more <laughs> compassion. I really love those points. We're going to talk more about communication with Janet Arnold. There's more coming up on Flavors of Africa. Stay tuned. And you're watching Flavors of Africa. Joining us today is Janet Arnold, a registered social worker from Mount Royal University, and we're talking about communication. Mm -hmm. And just while we're on the subject, when we look at certain cultures in Asia, maybe the, between the Chinese and the Japanese, mm -hmm. and we notice that, as you mentioned, the way of speaking is, is closer. And in North American society, we're far, farther apart. I think you said it was an arm's length. So does that speak to the way the society is structured at all? I think it does, and I think it also speaks to um, perhaps our individuality. We're a little bit more isolated, I believe, mm -hmm. as North Americans. It, it could also be just a factor of space. Like we, we have lots of room here, <laughs> um, and in and some places when there's so many people, the there isn't a lot of room for personal distance. Mm -hmm. So, um, I've I've heard a lot of Canadians too talk about even in lineups. Um, when you go to the movie lineup or the Tim Hortons lineup or something like that, we're packed in like sardines, and that can be pretty uncomfortable, but it's sort of expected when there's a lot of people around. And now you're, you're very experienced as a, as a social worker, as a registered social worker, and you also uh, focus on counseling with clients. Um, can you tell us maybe a little bit about more, more about that in terms of maybe newcomers and counseling? Certainly. Um, as a counselor at the university, uh, there's a lot of students that we have who come from somewhere else and depending on the culture or the nation that they have come from their view of counseling is quite uh, they're quite reticent to get into counseling so they don't want to because it's not something that they were kind of it was it was not something that was okay to do back mm -hmm. home so one of the things that's really important for me when I'm meeting with a new student from somewhere else is to help them understand the purpose of counseling that it's not it's not a judgmental process uh, it takes a lot of courage to come for counseling and if they look at it as getting advice from someone who may have more information about a particular issue than they would, mm -hmm. it's okay. Like if, uh, if I'm traveling to some country, I would probably talk to a, a travel agent. If I'm buying yes. insurance, I would talk with an insurance agent. If I'm buying a house, I would talk to a realtor. So we have people who are, are expert at a particular field. Counselors are experts at helping people solve their problems. So it's not about um, being bad to get into counseling. It's actually saying, I want to solve something that's going wrong in my life and I'm turning to someone who has more understanding and more information than I do. 
So it's a, it's a collaborative process. And as a counselor, our role is to, at least my perspective, is to help empower the, the student to be able to make their own decisions in a way that's, that they feel comfortable with the most knowledge that they have. And I, I help them provide the knowledge and the encouragement to make those decisions that they're making. Yeah, giving you uh, years of experience, can you now say that uh, immigrants, you know, that they're open to, you know, coming and taking advantage of the services yes. that your organization has to offer? Is it better now than it was, say, when you first studied in this field? Much better, I yes. See. And I, I find that some, some of the students that come to our service, uh, they will tell their friends. And then they'll say, you know what, it really wasn't so bad. And they helped me, and they didn't judge me, and they gave me advice, and they helped me see that I really am a strong person. I just happened to run into a problem that I didn't know how to solve. And then, so then their friends start coming. And, and to me, that's the best compliment. How can we continue to be welcoming and warm to uh, newcomers who are coming to Canada and, you know, maybe struggling with the way that we communicate? I think bottom line has to be our attitude and our appreciation. Canada became the country that it is because people came from somewhere else. That's why I also love Calgary. Is Calgary is better because we have people coming from somewhere else and that makes us a stronger community. So for, for people who are here welcoming newcomers to be able to have the perspective that every new person is making us a stronger community, they're bringing they're bringing diversity, they're bringing arts and culture and, and new perspectives and new outlooks on things. And that's what makes our community great. So if we have that perspective, bottom line, I think we're gonna, we're gonna do well. <laughs> this is great. So if somebody wants to reach you, how can they reach you? They can uh, go on to the Mount Royal website and look up accessibility services. Awesome. So that's where I am full time. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Jenna. It's, it's been really a pleasure. A, it's a pleasure Thank you so having much you for here. Having us. Thank you. And we have more for being here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we have more coming up on Flavors of Africa, so stay tuned. And welcome back. You're watching Flavors of Africa. We're taking a look at American style cooking. So we're all the way down south, of course, in, in terms of the food. And so we're, we're focusing a lot on the United States right mm -hmm. now because a lot of people in the US, they trace their roots to Africa. And of course, coming to Af coming from Africa to the United States, mm -hmm. uh, so certain cultures and customs were brought to the US. And you know, the country's relatively old. I mean, a lot older than Canada. Yes, yes. Uh, it was established on July 4th, of course. That's why we have the, they have the big 4th of July celebration. Right. Uh, in the year 1774, president is none other than Barack Obama, who was uh, re-elected not too long ago, and the vice president is Joe Biden. So we're just taking a look at the food. <laughs> exactly, so today, we're going to make the gumbo, you know, and in New Orleans is very traditional, the gumbo. And they use flour and butter, sometimes uh, pig uh, uh, drippings to make the, the thickness sauce. And here at Flavors of Africa, we, we are not going to do any of that. We're going to use a special ingredient handed down from one generation to the other from my mother's kitchen. So that's what we're going to use. And the reason why we're not using flour, not because it's not good, the reason being that some people are allergic to flour. That's right, they're celiac. Exactly, so that's why we decided to use a special ingredient to thicken our sauces. And this dish is also widely celebrated in New Orleans. Exactly, the gumbo, you it's know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yes. it's a popular dish, and you know people have been asking about it. Yes. And you know, I mean, just cooking and seeing all the beautiful colors that, that we're going to put together with the ingredients, it just yes. reminds you sort of exactly. about New Orleans and exactly. the customs that take place there. Yeah. So we have uh, the okra that goes into the gumbo. We have some mushrooms. We have all our peppers. So we're going to start with the onions. So just one medium-sized onion, and depending on the size of your dish, 
you don't need to use the whole thing so if you don't mind i'm yes. gonna be uh cutting and then you're gonna be so I'll move cooking to yeah <laughs> exactly so and i'm sure that you would like to visit New Orleans oh for sure it's a, music. it's a beautiful place yeah. right <laughs> so we just chop the onion and half of it will do because it's it's a, you know it's a vegetable. So let's check to make sure that our stove is cooperating. Okay, it's fantastic. So the first ingredient that we're going to add, we're gonna add our chicken. So you add the chicken, and then the onions. Notice in the last in one of the episodes when we did the um, the okra, we did it the West African style. We didn't have to put uh, all these ingredients. So today, because it's gumbo, it's, it calls for uh, celery, you know, tomatoes, you name it. So that's why we're doing it this way. And another interesting thing about the United States is definitely the history. Exactly. You know that. African Americans come mm -hmm. come with it. I mean, with the with the ancestry and the civil rights movement. Yes. it's very uh, it's a very important that we sort of focus on on those historical occurrences, exactly. such as the sit-ins and the freedom rides that took oh, place with Martin is. Luther King. The next, uh, so we just put the onions. You know, it's so easy. You don't even have to, you know, um, do it in order. Just put it in. No wahala. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and cut the tomatoes. So we'll add our tomatoes. And I would say that Rosa Parks is one of my favorite uh, you know, activists. Exactly. I mean, it just she went to show that it took one person to stand up and make a great change. Yes. So. Yeah, that, that was very interesting because if she didn't do it, you know, exactly. I mean, no one else would have. It just takes that one voice. Exactly. And, you know, sometimes they say, well, you know, you remember in those days, they used to say, oh, America wasn't ready for a black, a black pres president. A president. And, I mean, but look at what happened today. Exactly. Uh, president Obama is the president of uh, yeah. the United States. So I'm going to go ahead and cut my um, sausages. Well, sausages, if you don't like sausages, you don't need to put it. If you like them, please go ahead and put them. They give it a distinct uh, taste. It's really awesome. So I'm just going to go ahead and chop our mushroom. Once again, you don't even need to add uh, mushrooms. The, this dish does not call, call for mushroom, but you know, it's a uh, gumbo. You can add anything you want. No <laughs> wahala. So, it's sort of just like diversity with the exactly. adding and the difference. Yeah, don't you like it? It's beautiful. So, and here is the spices. This is the uh, special spices that go into making the gumbo. So, that's what gives it the taste. So, or the punch. And just a little bit of salt. Okay, so you see how it's beginning to build up. <laughs> it's beautiful. So, did you ever think that you would end up in this side of the world? <laughs> no, I didn't because, like I always tell people, I love Nigeria so you know so much. I love my parents, and I I wanted to see them grow old. So I didn't even feel like traveling, leaving them, but I must tell you that when you fall in love, it's a different story. <laughs> so when I met my husband, I thought, well, I had to go, you know. <laughs> so that's what it is. So the next ingredients is just uh, two cloves of uh, garlic. So you just add it in. All right, so we're gonna let this cook down. Sounds good. So when we come back, we show you, you know, how it's coming and then the finished product, of course. 
So let's uh, take a break. Sounds good. More coming up on Flavors of Africa. Welcome back to Flavors of Africa. We're taking in some Southern American culture and we're gonna ma we're making a delicious gumbo here today. So. Awesome. So, like I already said, so we're gonna use this to thicken our sauce. So just a, a little bit, not so much. Okay, yeah, keep going. Just a little, be generous. But <laughs> All right, so that we thicken it instead of flour. And uh, while you're mixing that, we're gonna go ahead and add our sausages. Smells delicious. Awesome. And then I will add some uh, water, just a little bit, about a cup of uh, water. Okay, so the next ingredient that I'm going to add is the okra. I mean, you can make it without the, some people make gumbo without okra, but I find that with okra, is better so that's what it is so we're gonna let this you know keep cooking we can okay. just leave it we don't even have to cover it, it. so it's gonna simmer and uh, then we can get the taste the taste of it so we have one that has been cooking since morning so we have the finished product here all right and i'm just gonna go ahead and dump it anyways it, right? exactly So this is what uh, gumbo looks like. It has shrimp, it has everything in it. It's going to be so uh, delicious. <laughs> and we have, we have uh, brown rice here instead of uh, white rice because we're trying to eat healthy, <laughs> you know, for you, our wonderful viewers. So gumbo and rice, they go very, very well. So. And make sure that you try the gumbo dish at home and you can like us on Facebook and post your pictures there or even send us a tweet. We'll put our Twitter up, address up there and as well as our email address. Awesome. And as, I, as we always say, remember that cultures that eat together stay together. Through food, we can continue to appreciate diversity and promote cultural unity. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.